الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم My dear brothers and sisters those who are with us here in the Islamic Center of Palm Beach North Palm Beach or those who are listening online we are going to continue our speech in regards to um, Jumat al-khutbah uh, the sermon and uh, the ruling of Jumat prayers Sheikh Saleh bin Fawzan al Fawzan he said while delivering the sermon the Imam is permitted to talk to any of the persons led in prayer and they are, they are permitted to speak to him for any legal interest it happened in many situations that the Prophet ﷺ talked and listened to an inquirer. Also, the Prophet ﷺ talked and listened to some companions for the sake of a legal interest or to teach them religious rulings. This kind of speaking is permissible, like someone, you know, who's going to talk to the Imam while the Imam is giving the khutbah in regards to something very beneficial. And the Imam, he gives him the answer so everybody can learn this thing. This is something good. This is permissible to say to the Imam and the Imam can speak to them. He said this kind of uh, speaking is permissible as it does not distract people's attention while listening to the sermon. While listening to the sermon, one is not permitted to give charity to a beggar. While you are listening to the sermon and when you hear someone outside, uh, you know, asking for sadaqah or the like, you don't give him sadaqah at that time. Likewise, it's not permissible to do business at that time. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayu alladheena amanu idha nudiya li salati min yawmul jumu'ah, fas'awi la dhikri Allahi wa daru al-bay'ah. We who believe, <coughs> when the adhan of yawmul jumu'ah is called out, Hasten to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leave off trade. Leave off trade. So any business is haram at that time. And any uh, business contract signed at that time is invalid. Is invalid. So it is not permissible to do that. As he, the beggar, in this case, does, does an impermissible act. So one should not help him in such an act, i.e. speaking while the sermon is delivered. When the preacher confers blessing upon the Prophet ﷺ, it is an act of the sunnah for a Muslim to confer blessing upon the Prophet ﷺ, but without raising his voice in order not to distract the attention of others. So if the Imam, for example, questions, are, we don't answer questions now. So if the imams uh, mentioned the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he, he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it is permissible for you uh, to confer blessing on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you say sallallahu alaihi wasallam but you don't raise your voice you don't raise you, so you say it to yourself you don't raise your voice because if you raise your voice then uh, you will distract others when the preacher invokes Allah, it is an act of the sunnah for Muslim to say Ameen. Raising neither his voice nor his hand. Because the Prophet wasallam he did not raise his hand. And you see a lot of people doing this on Yom Al-Jumu'ah, the day of Jumu'ah. You see many people, uh, you see them raising their hand. And it is not from the sunnah to raise your hand while you're making dua on the minbar, or those who are being led. Likewise, you see a lot of people do this after, um, you know, every obligatory prayer, people, they raise their hand and they start making dua. As a matter of fact, as scholars, they say this is bid'ah, innovation. Because the Prophet wasallam he did not do it. And the Sahaba did not do it. And the Tabi'een did not do it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, while the preacher is delivering the sermon, it is detestable or prohibited by informed agreement for a Muslim to raise his voice. 
and neither the prayer caller, Muazzin, nor anyone else should raise his voice with conferring blessing upon the Prophet Sallallahu or by doing anything else. So even the Muaddin, he should not raise his voice when the Imam and the one who's delivering the khutbah, he sent peace and the blessing on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You say, you don't say it out loud. You can say it, but to yourself. It is noteworthy that such a wrong act, which Ibn Taymiyyah pointed out, are still committed in some countries. Some example of such act are raising one's voices when conferring blessing upon the Prophet Sallallahu or supplications during or before the sermon or before the two sermon moreover some preachers may order those present to commit such act this is very common some, some, some of the preachers they will say Sallu ala nabi and then you hear the whole masjid Allahumma salli wa sallim you know all of them this is not from the, the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the companions, radiallahu anhum. This is not something permissible to do, uh, even though it is something good to send peace and blessing on the Prophet but that's not the way uh, the Prophet did it or commanded the Sahaba to do it. There's nothing like that. This is considered ignorance and innovation in the religion, which is not permitted to be done. So it is ignorance, and it is also bid'ah, innovation, because it was not done, by the Prophet or the Sahaba. A Muslim must not greet others if he enters the mosque while the Imam is delivering the sermon. He doesn't say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. While the Imam is, is, is de- delivering the sermon. He does not greet. Like now, someone enters, he has say, Assalamu alaikum, it's okay. But not while the Imam is giving, giving the sermon. Rather, he should proceed calmly to any available place in the rows, any available place in the rows. Perform two short rak'at, as mentioned previously, and sit to listen to the sermon without shaking hands with those near him. During the sermon, one is not permitted to play with his hand, foot, beard, clothes, and the like. Because some people, they like, they like to fiddle with their, with their beard, and you know, they like to play with their you know, clothes and the like. And it's like a habit. Some people, they, they, they can't just sit still. They'll be like playing with their clothes or, or playing with, with something, you know? For the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever touches pebbles while the Imam is delivering the Friday sermon, paying no attention to the sermon, has made an evil act. Has made an evil act. A tirmidhi deemed it sahih, authentic hadith. Another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, and whoever makes an evil act, no Friday, I mean, means no reward for the Friday prayer will be recorded for him. So he will lose the reward. Subhanallah. This is because playing prevents devoutness. Because when you play, you're not concentrated on what the Imam is saying. You're in a different world. Likewise, those people play with their cell phone. Some of them, it's very strange. You see them talking on the phone while the Imam is delivering the khutbah. Or they're playing, they're answering questions while, or, or, or they, they're answering a message or something like that. Someone, someone sent them, I don't answer questions right now, please. So, people, they, they send questions while, you know, the imam, you know, the, you know they, 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 they send text messages while the imam is delivering the khutbah. And this is not right. This is because playing prevents devoutness. During the sermon, a Muslim should not turn right or left, nor look at the people around him, in order not to be distracted from listening to the sermon. Rather, he should face the preacher, looking at him as the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, used to face the Prophet ﷺ during his sermon. This is the way, the adab, the etiquette, that those who are present, they should face the one who's given, given the khutbah, that way they are focused on the sermon. They're not like looking here, looking there, looking up, looking down. Some people looking at their watches, some, some of them looking at their cell phones and the like. This is not correct. These people, they don't have like really a reverence. They don't have a reverence for khutbat al-jumu'ah, or jumu'ah sermon. 
Some of them, they don't, wanna, they, they don't even come for the Jum'a khutbah. They come uh, when the Imam is about to pray. Subhanallah, Allah al-Musta'an. The Shaykh uh, Salih Fuzan, he said, during his sermon, if one sneezes, one should praise Allah secretly. Secretly. He doesn't say, Alhamdulillah. La. He said it to himself. Yes, when you are in a gathering other than the khutbah and the like, and you sneeze, you say, Alhamdulillah. And the person next to you, he should say, Allah. Oh, and then you say, Yahdikumullahu wa yuslih balakum. This is how you respond to them. If they say, Allah, you say, Yahdikumullahu wa yuslih balakum. For the sake of a legal interest, a Muslim is permitted to talk before or after the sermon or during the interval between the two sermons. Okay. So, permitted to talk before, because before it's permissible to talk before the sermon starts and after the sermon's finish, you can talk. And in between. In between means when there is an interval, with the, when the imam sits for the next uh, khutbah. For the next khutbah. Because the imam, he splits the khutbah in half. So the first part and the second part. So when he sits on the minbar, you can talk at that time. <coughs> But when he gets up and he starts delivering, then you don't talk. No. The Sheikh he said, however, one should not talk about worldly matters. Worldly matters. Should not talk about worldly matters. In general, the two sermons of Friday, the sermon of Friday is divided into two parts, are extremely important in Islam as they contain the recitation of the noble Quran. And some hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, useful guidance, good instructions, and remembrance of the days of Allah. So the preacher and listeners must pay attention to the sermon, to the two sermons. The Friday sermon is not an ordinary speech delivered in clubs or during celebrations or usual meetings. It is worthy mentioning that during the Friday sermon, some listeners raise their voices, seek refuge with Allah when they hear a warning, or invoking Allah when they hear some mentioning of the paradise or the rewards of Allah. This, is, this act is not permissible, and it is included in the acts forbidden to be done during the sermon. The legal texts indicate that talking during the Friday sermon renders good deeds worthless. And whoever talks during Friday's sermon will have no reward for the Friday prayer and will be like a donkey that carries volumes of books. Subhanallah. Because you know uh, that this donkey is carrying volumes of books. He's not going to benefit from those books. You see? They could be very beneficial books. Huh? But he will not benefit from those books. Likewise, this person who talks during the sermon is like a donkey was carrying, you know, these books, but he's not going to benefit from them. So one must guard oneself against such forbidden acts and warn others to guard themselves against them. Faqihs, may Allah have mercy on them, mention that the Jum'ah Friday prayer as in, is an independent obligation, not substitute for Dhuhr. You know, it's not a substitute for Dhuhr, it's independent. It's not a substitute, you understand? Because some people, they think Jumu'ah is a substitute for Dhuhr. And some of them, what they do, they're very extreme. What they do, they pray Jumu'ah, they pray Dhuhr. Have you heard of this? Yeah, some people pray Jumu'ah and then they pray Dhuhr after that. They pray Dhuhr after that. This is extreme, this is bid'ah also. Because the Prophet said, he did not do it like that. He did not do it because Jumu'ah prayer is an independent Salat. And that's why Sheikh Al-Utaymin, rahimahullah, he said it is not permissible to combine Al-Jumu'ah with Asr. To combine Al-Jumu'ah with Asr. But you can combine Dhuhr with Asr. When you're traveling, for example. You're traveling, right? And, for example, you prayed Maghrib in a masjid. You, I'm sorry, you prayed uh, Jumu'ah in a masjid. You prayed with the Imam, Al-Jumu'ah. 
You cannot combine the Jumu'ah with Dhuhr. Why? Because the Jumu'ah is not a substitute for Dhuhr. It is an independent prayer. Because it is an independent prayer. This is a very important point. The Shaykh said, Habibullah Ta'ala, the prayer of the traveler is two rak'at units. The Jum'ah prayer is two rak'at. The feast prayer is two rak'at. Al-Eid means Salat al-Eid. These prayers are complete, not shortened, according to what is what your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So they are not shortened, they are complete. The Jum'ah prayer differs from Dor prayer in many ways. So this is a very good point. The Shaykh is going to explain to us why Jum'ah prayer is different from Dor. Right? So he said, since the former is better and more stress than the latter, and more warning and narrated concerning whoever leaves Jum'ah prayer, in addition, the Jum'ah prayer has some conditions and specialties which Dor prayer does not have. It is not sufficient for any Muslim for whom Jum'ah prayer is obligatory to perform the Dor prayer instead of the Jum'ah prayer unless the due time of the latter is over. Is over. For example, if, um, uh, for example, you had an excuse, right? You had, an, you had a valid excuse, right? And you could not pray Jum'ah until the time, like that's it, finished for Salat al-Jum'ah. So the Imam is done, everything is done. Then what do you do? You pray Dor. For example, some people come in late, and we prayed Salat al-Jum'ah. So in that case, they don't say, well, let's pray only two rak'at because today is Jum'ah. No, they don't do that. They pray Dor. Because the timing is finished. The timing is finished. So the Imam concluded the prayer. So at that time you pray Dhuhr for Rak'at. Now, the Shaykh he said, Jum'ah prayer is obligatory to perform Dhuhr prayer instead of the Jum'ah prayer unless the due time of the ladder is over. And only then the Dhuhr prayer becomes a substitute. The Jum'ah prayer is an individual duty for every legally competent, competent, free. So when he says free, it is not incumbent upon the slave. It is not incumbent upon the slave. And uh, competent. What does he mean by competent? Competent, somebody competent. What does he mean by that? Anybody knows? Reliable. لا, مش reliable. Competent means uh, uh, able, able to do it. He's, he's able to do it. Right? But like for example, a prisoner. Is he able to go to the masjid and pray? Juma? No. He's not able to. So what does he do? He prays? He prays door. He prays, barakallahu feekum, door. If they can, if they can, the prisoners, if they are a lot of Muslim prisoners, and they can perform Salat al-Jumu'ah in the prison, then they can do it. They can do it. If they have someone knowledgeable who can uh, give a sermon, and then they pray together to rak'at al-Jumu'ah, this is fine. But if they can't, they pray Dhuhr. Likewise, a crazy person, is a crazy person competent? No. He's not competent. He's not competent. Is it wajib upon him to pray Jumu'ah? It's not wajib. Likewise, a sick person who cannot get up from his bed, bedridden, he's bedridden. Is he competent to perform Jumu'ah prayer? He's not. So it is not obligatory upon him to go and attend it. So he can pray Dhuhr prayer. The Sheikh he said, a resident male Muslim, okay, very important, a resident. In other words, if you are a traveler, it's not obligatory upon you. Male. So in other words, the female are not obligated. The female are not obligated to perform Salat al-Jumu'ah. 
You see? It's not, oblig- it's not obligatory upon them to come to the masjid to perform the five daily salawat. But if they wish to come, their husband should not prevent them unless, unless uh, they don't listen to the husband, for example, they go out for without hijab, or for example, they put on perfume when they want to go to the masjid, then in that case, you, you say, no, you can't go. If you're not going to abide by the, by the guidelines of the sharia, I'm not going to let you go. Now, طيب, Abu Dawood, Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, <coughs> Abu Dawood relates with, the, he, with his chain of transmitters on the authority of Tariq ibn Shihab that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said performing Jum'ah prayer is in congregation is an obligation upon every Muslim with four exception with four exception a slave a woman a boy and a sick person because a slave he doesn't have you know control over his slavery so he cannot just go and uh, pray without his master's permission طيب, that's the first second one a woman a woman is not required to perform salat jumu'ah so it's not obligatory upon her it's not obligatory upon her a boy because a boy here the one who has not reached puberty yet who has not, like, like Ali, for example, Rayyan, they have not reached puberty yet, it's not obligatory upon them to perform Salat al-Jumu'ah. It's not, it's not obligatory. And a sick person also, sick person, because sickness is an obstacle, is an obstacle. Laysa al maridi haraj. There is no blame upon a sick person. The transmitters of this hadith are trustworthy. And it is deemed sahih, authentic, by many, by many scholars. Ad-Dara Qutni also relates with his chain of transmitters on the authority of Jabir. May Allah be pleased with him. Yani Jabir bin Abdullah, radiyallahu anhu. The Prophet mm-hmm. said, whoever believes in Allah and the last day must perform Jum'ah prayer in congregation with, with four exceptions. A sick person, a traveler, a boy, and a slave. See here, they, they didn't mention the woman. But in the other hadith, he mentioned the woman. But he mentioned someone else that was not mentioned in the other hadith. Who is he? The traveler. Because the traveler is not obligatory upon a traveler to perform Salat Jumu'ah. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, The Jumu'ah prayer is obligatory upon every group of people living in permanent houses. In other words, if they were nomad. Huh? Are, they, are they in permanent houses? Nomad? Okay. No, they're, they're moving around. They're traveling here and there. Those, they are not required to perform al Jumu'ah because they're travelers. Right? So pay attention to the, state, to the wording of the scholars. So when he says permanent houses, permanent. So they're stationary. They're not moving around. Close together. Close together. In other words, if they were like very far away from each other, right? One in a state, ten here in one state, ten here in another state. You understand? So they're, they're, they're close to each other. Whether such houses are built with mud, wood, reeds, palm branches, or any other material, as long as they do not depart from such a place in summer or winter, look, as long as they don't depart from those places in summer or winter. Because if they do, they become what? Travelers. They become what? Travelers. The kind of material is insignificant to the aforementioned legal obligation. The original rule concerning this is that they should be permanently resident and not like nomads. SubhanAllah, I did not even see, see it. Nomads. So they're not like nomads who live in tents and move from one place to another. Those are not required to perform Salat al-Jumu'ah because they are not stationary. They are not stationary. Carrying their houses with them whenever they go, seeking a rain. Seeking a rain. 
And that's why when uh, uh, the story of Ismail, peace be upon him, I felt like adding this benefit here in this class. The, the story of Ismail, peace be upon him, and his mother, Hajar, when the water gushed forth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the water, the zimzam water, to gush forth on the earth. So what happened? They were nomads from the Arabs. They were nomads that came from uh, Yemen. And there was a Qabila, a tribe called Jurhum. Jurhum. So this Qabila, they were uh, they're looking for water. Because that's the main thing. If you have water, then you can settle in that place where there's water. So they saw the bird hovering around. They knew that there is water there. So they came. They found uh, Hajar and Ismail, her baby Ismail. So they asked her if they can use the water. If they can share the water. And she gave them permission. So they settled their tents there. So Ismail grew up with this tribe. And he married one of them. He married from that tribe. So this is something that I felt like sharing with you. And subhanallah, the animals didn't know. So the water, when the bird, you see the bird hovering around, going around, then you know that there is water there. Subhanallah. Actually, there are some people, they buy experience. And I know you have them in different countries. Where I come from, we have them. Like, this man is not like an engineer or anything like that. He just has experience. Experience. That he will tell you that there is water in this land. And when you dig, you find water. Subhanallah. Yes. I don't know if you have anything like that in Tunisia and other areas. Do you have that in Bangladesh? We have people like this. In Saudi Arabia also they have that. I forgot the name of that person. But subhanAllah, by experience, they will tell you that there is water here in this area. Tayyib, we continue inshallah from where we left off about uh, Salat al-Jumu'ah. Tayyib. The Jumu'ah prayer is not obligatory upon travelers who are permitted to shorten prayers as the Prophet and his companion used to travel for Hajj or any other purpose, and none of them perform Jum'ah prayer during travel. The Jum'ah prayer is not obligatory upon whoever goes on a picnic and the like, and finds no mosque around, like for example, you go to an area where there is no mosque, you are in the middle of the country. You don't pray Jum'ah, you don't pray, you pray with the door. And is to perform door prayer instead of Jum'ah prayer. In addition, the Jum'ah prayer is not obligatory upon women. Ibn al-Mundir, as well as other scholars said, scholars unanimously agree, means ijma'ah, there is ijma'ah. All of them agree. That the Jum'ah prayer is not obligatory upon women. And that if women go to the mosque, listen to the Friday prayer, and perform Jum'ah prayer, this serves instead of performing the door prayer. So it will count for them as Juma prayer. Likewise, a traveler or an ill person is permitted to perform Juma prayer instead of the door prayer. If he's able, for Allah excuses such persons from performing Juma prayer to lighten difficulties for them. It is not permissible for a Muslim upon whom the Juma prayer is obligatory to travel on Friday after meridian unless he performs prayer. Moreover, it is detestable for him to travel even before meridian. If he is not, he is not to perform Jum'ah prayer on his way. There are some legal conditions which make the Jum'ah prayer valid. Jum'ah prayer must be performed at its due time, which is a condition for it, as the case with other obligatory prayers, Thus, the Jum'ah prayer is not valid if performed either before or after its due time. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
Indeed, prayer has been decreed upon the believers, a decree of specified time. In salata kanat al muminina kitab al mawquta. It is better and more cautious to perform Jum'a prayer after meridian, as it is the time when the Prophet used to perform this prayer. It is a controversial issue to perform Jum'a before meridian. There is no dispute that the end of the time of Jum'a prayer is the same as the end of the time of Zuhr prayer. Number two, observed Jum'a prayer must be a residence in houses built with any usual material. Not like nomads who live in tents and move with their houses from one place to another seeking rain. This is because the Prophet ﷺ did not order the Arab tribes living around Medina to perform Jum'a prayer. If a Muslim catches up with one rak'ah, he can complete his prayer as he has already caught up with the Jum'a prayer. So if you, if you, if you, if you come in late, right, you come in late, and you, you caught one rak'ah, you caught up one rak'ah, then you make up one rak'ah. You, you make up one rak'ah, and then that's it. This is Jum'a for you. But if you came in and the imam was in, was in uh, uh, tashahud, was in tashahud, then you lose it. You lose Jum'a prayer, so you have to pray door at that time. The Shaykh, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Bayhaqi records on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu an, the Prophet said, whoever could get one rak'ah of Jum'a prayer in its proper time has got the prayer. That's it. The origin of this hadith is recorded in two sahih. A Muslim misses the Jum'a prayer if he gets less than one rak'ah of the Jum'a prayer. If he joins the prayer after the imam has risen from bowing in the second rak'ah, then he is to intend to perform to perform door prayer and perform four rak'at as the door prayer after the imam pronounces the final salutation. So now if you come in and the imam is uh, rising from a ruku'ah of second rak'ah, then you lost, you lost Salat al-Jum'ah. You lost it. You missed it. So in that case, what do you do when he, when he salams out? You pray door. You pray door. The two sermons are considered the condition of the Jum'a prayer as the Prophet ﷺ used the two sermons before uh, performing the Jum'a prayer. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said the Prophet ﷺ used to deliver two sermons while standing and sitting between. So he would sit in between, related by Bukhari and Muslim. In addition, among the conditions that make the two sermons of Jum'a prayer is that they must re- contain words of praise of Allah, declaring the two testification of faith, conferring blessing upon the Prophet Sallallahu giving advice to fear Allah, as well as good instructions and the recitation of the Noble Quran. Even one verse, many sermons of preachers Nowadays, lack some or most of the aforementioned condition. Wallahi, this is true. Some masajid, when you listen to the khutbah of the imam, you feel like you are in CNN building, like you are in a, listening to a news cast or something like that. You know, subhanAllah, all he talks about is political affairs. And you don't hear anything from the Quran, from the hadith, Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a political khutbah. So the khutbah is politically driven. And the people, they get more politically emotional and they start yelling and screaming and, and, that, and he gets them wild up, you know? But there's no benefit. There's no benefit in that khutbah and that khutbah is against al-kitab wa sunnah because there, is, there are no ahadith, no ayat from the Quran, no ahadith from the Prophet nothing, no guidance. So in khutbah, we must stick to get to the kitab and sunnah and the way the Prophet ﷺ performed it, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all al-ilm al-nafi' wal-amal salih. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.